All right, back at it. Really, we're still using the same gray sheet. Can we up the production value a little bit up in here? Well, let's get a new background, huh? No. No. Definitely not. And we're back to the same gray sheet. What What is different about this? Oh, okay, yeah, no, let's, let's definitely keep it here. All right. Oh, dang it. Hi there, welcome to the show, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Casey Bryant, and this is the Hat City Hockey Show, a new web series covering all things hat tricks, hockey, and whatever else I feel like talking about. It's my gray sheet, I'll do what I want. Our games in the Federal Prospects Hockey League are set to start in January, if all goes well, and those games will be hosted right here on the Hat Tricks YouTube channel. But that's still a ways away, so in the meantime, we're going to fill the void with whatever form of random entertainment pops into our heads. We kind of got a head start on that by accident, what with the whole inexplicable five-part give and take with one of television's most beloved personalities ending with the renaming of a government property. That's the bar. And let me tell you, we plan on artfully limboing under that bar all night long. But seriously, we have some great guests lined up for this show that you will not want to miss an episode of. Even our subscribers who aren't big hockey fans will be doing our best to entertain you. And worst case scenario, you still have this dashingly handsome face to look at. Looking like a prepubescent Eric from that 70s show. So what's going on in the hockey world? Well, the NHL released their new line of reverse retro jerseys with all 31 teams unveiling new iterations of old designs. I love the Rangers Lady Liberty jersey, the Bruins gold looks solid, and the Islanders clearly woke up the morning of and said, wait, it's due when? Oh God! The Bruins one does rank as one of the funniest in the league in my mind because if you take a look at the shoulders, this is true. This is the patch that they went with. Look at this thing! It's actually a sponsored ad for Paddington 3. The bear's on meth now. The fact that so many Islander fans are mad that they didn't get the Gorton's Fisherman logo back, while other fans around the league are celebrating the return of the Anaheim Ducks Wild Wing jerseys or the Arizona Coyotes Peyote Coyote designs, is proof that anything mocked and maligned in the 90s is due for a resurgence in popularity, which bodes well for Vanilla Ice and a young Casey Bryant. Hang in there, bud. Your day will come. One day. Before we get to our first guest, we wanted to highlight our charity of the week. Every episode, we're going to be highlighting a new cause just to spread some goodwill, which is much needed around the holiday season and 2020 in general. So our featured charity of the week is Movember, which is raising awareness for men's health issues such as prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and suicide prevention. You may notice that I am sans Movember stash right now, but that wasn't always the case. I did try to impress my first guest. You'll understand why. Take a look. I am very excited to introduce my first guest here on the Hat City Hockey Show. He is one of the toughest players on the Danbury Hattricks team, a leader on the ice and off it, and he has re-signed for a second season with the team. Please welcome number eight, Phil Bronner. Phil. How you doing, man? Good. That's nice muzzy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> The first question I have for you right out of the gate is the most important one, uh, which is how does my stash compare to yours? I mean, I've heard that I look like a young Randy Johnson, uh, but but what do you think? No, that's that's pretty impressive. Is that uh, all natural or did you uh, just for a minute to uh, make it stand out a little more? You know, I've heard <laughs> that certain members of the team have had to resort to dyeing their mustaches to get it to be visible. Uh, is it true that that is what Cruz had to do? I don't know what he was thinking on that, but yes, he did dye his, his mustache. Uh, he thought it looked better that way, and it was definitely a big mistake. That thing looked like a caterpillar crawling across his face. I've never seen a caterpillar that ugly, so... Well, I mean, uh, you obviously have the sickest stash in the game. You do it every November for the cause of Movember. Thank you. What is it about Movember that speaks to you, or is it just an opportunity for you to flex your facial hair muscles uh when my career first started i was just clean shaven guy and um you know some of the guys did the mustaches for november and i did one like yours um that wasn't the full handlebars yet and like halfway through i was like this thing's stupid i'm, I'm gonna shave it off and then um i think maybe two seasons later a couple guys were doing doing it for the movember foundation which is for 
you know, men's health, uh, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, um, mental health awareness, suicide prevention. Um, and I was just like, you know what, like, I'll bring it back. And I was like, this time around, I'm going to do the big, scary, you know, enforcer mustache and uh, got a lot of compliments from like <laughs> other guys playing against them and, you know, even refs. And um, I know it's obnoxious, but I was like, whatever, it looks pretty cool in pictures. I look like a psychopath as a, a pedestrian, but as a hockey player, it, it, it plays. So <laughs> it's all about the aesthetic, right? I mean, the, the playoff beard or the playoff stash is always a, a staple in hockey culture. So yep. I, I'd assume you'd fit right in. And I see these popped up on the internet. Uh, these shirts that are being sold by by a fan store yep. online that feature your mustache on. Let's take a look there. Yeah, I mean, those yeah. look great. Got the number eight <laughs> stash game 100 section 102 store. So yeah, I saw that. I was like, hell yeah. And they're donating proceeds to Movember as well. And my moving company, we've raised over five grand already. We've been donating like 25 bucks a move and doing a bunch of other stuff too. So this will be... Um, a little more uh, hidden as the beard begins to come back as we head towards December. So, and when the beard does come back, it, it comes back in, in full stride. It looks like a chia pet growing out of your uh, <laughs> your chin. <laughs> for sure. What has as we are locked down here and we're waiting for the FPHL season to come back? What has kept you sane through this whole process? What are you watching, reading, listening to? Uh, what what has kept you going? I got my headset here. This was an early uh, quarantine purchase for, uh, you know, talk trash when I'm playing uh, Xbox, NHL or uh, football, um, whether it's just against random kids that are probably, you know, 15 years old or, uh, you know, just a couple of buddies. Uh, a couple months ago, I, I got a new debit card just for the reason to cancel all of my uh, streaming services because I had like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, HBO, <laughs> Showtime, uh, some random one I never heard of for like documentary series specifically. So I was like, all right, I got to just pick two of these because it's like I got everything and I'm, I'm not not watching that much. But, uh, you know, definitely I must have watched The Office three times all the way through. Um, you know, that's probably my favorite show. It's Always Sunny, another good uh, good binge watch. I've been on a big It's Always Sunny kick because I had been a couple of seasons behind. So I caught up on seasons 13 and 14 lately. I mean, it's, they still got their fast yeah, they, after 15 years. And I mean, something else to have kept you uh, sane, I'm sure. Uh, I understand that congratulations are in order. You got engaged lately? Yeah. Um, went down what was it i think it was a week ago from this monday so like two weeks ago but met my girl well fiance excuse me um in roanoke when i was playing there on tinder it was like a couple weeks left in the season and i was kind of telling her like hey this is minor pro hockey like i could be on a different team next year or whatever like this probably isn't a good idea and um you know she wouldn't let me go so we stuck it through the summer i got protected by roanoke Went, I was like, all right, we're good. We can make it official now. And then uh, last day of training camp, I got traded to the new expansion team, Quad City in Illinois. And I was like, thank you, coach. Uh, <laughs> and But, you know, credit her. She stuck with me. She was flying to Quad City, made a bunch of games. She was meeting us on the road in Huntsville. Wow. And, um, you know, she came to a bunch of games last year in Danbury. Um, and it's just been, you know, my number one fan by my side this whole time. So got a ring, like I was sitting on it for maybe two months and got the blessing from her, her parents. And then I pretended that I was going to leave like I always do, um, and drive back here. And then, um, her parents were actually going down to their Florida home. So they gave me the key to their house. And then I went in there and set up you know did the full bachelor thing the rose petals on the ground candles <laughs> lit, and they sent her over there um to do like some bullshit Aaron. um and she just saw me in the door and you know i was down on a knee so definitely surprised her um but you know we're we're excited so that's awesome congratulations to you man i mean that's that's really fantastic and uh that's a real one right there who sticks with you through hockey trades and makes all the travel and you must have been inspired because i know you're a big bachelor fan yeah i was like she knows the the parties that you know me and the boys throw and the production value so i can't do this uh you know i don't think a ring in a champagne glass or or something like that's gonna do it so i had to go all out and give her the the, the final rose treatment <laughs> 
Well done. Good for you. Uh, and speaking of uh, the boys uh, looking ahead to next season, uh, because the FPHL is expecting to have a schedule tentatively released within the next week or so, uh, taking a look up and down your roster, you guys are pretty stacked. Uh, Coach Anthony Bone and general manager Billy McCreary have assembled quite a roster. Uh, Anthony was very sure to retain the leadership core from last year, meaning you, meaning Corey, meaning Johnny, meaning uh, Nicola Levesque. Uh, so what are you most looking, looking forward to next year as a leader of the Hattricks team? Yeah, I mean, just I remember you asked me, you know, last year when I got to the rink and you were like, what kind of team do you guys want to be? And I said a championship team. What kind of team would you like to be this year? Uh, championship team. We are, you know, totally stacked. We're still going to have to, you know, put in the work. Uh, definitely really excited about, you know, the guys we got in and continuing the culture that we built last year and you know just finishing the job yeah and in particular two of the guys that are returning are two of your line mates uh, as mentioned before Levesque and Ruiz uh, the three of you when you guys played together last year had such instant chemistry yeah I, I forget what I think it was probably an article you wrote but called us the three-headed monsters and we kind of you know took to that and you know we send each other like little monster gifts and, and stuff like that but um you know i did something i started great. a thing i did it <laughs> yeah you did <laughs> um but yeah i mean you know me and nick i think play a a similar game whereas we're both bigger you know we don't mind dropping the gloves kind of power forwards he's a little bit better of a skater than i am um i think i play a little meaner than he does um and then johnny is just you know flying around, making plays happen, can fire the puck. So I just think it's, you know, the, the type of players that we are, um, we mesh really well together, can, you know, no one can stop us, so. You know, I know that you guys are probably chomping at the bit to get back out onto the ice. And I know fans are eager to get back in the building and, and cheer you guys on. Uh, is there anything that you would like to say uh, to all of the fans out there watching that are, that are waiting for the chance to come out and cheer you on? Yeah, no, for sure. I, like, I, I think I, you know, still rings true my, my road rage where I'm just like, man, I hope this guy gets a little too close behind me at this light. I might just pop out of my car. Like I need to, you know, we, I got all this energy. I got, you know, I need to hit somebody. It's been too long. Like you, you play single A hockey for the fans. You know, we're not making a million bucks. We're, you know, just doing it because we love the game and, you know, uh, God willing people are going to pay to watch us. Like we'll, we'll put on a show for them. So, um, hope to get everybody back in the building and, and, uh, you know, see section 102 going crazy again. Before you, I let you go, I want to have one quick experiment here for you. I've got some samples of some mustaches from around the game. I want to get your grade on all of them, how they stack up. Number one here, what do you think about Lanny McDonald? He might be the GOAT. I think that's the, the OG stash there, you know, and obviously matches the jersey. It does. Let's see. Here's another one for you. Aaron Rodgers. Looks like he probably wouldn't be allowed within 200 feet of a school. <laughs> now, you're not just saying that because you're more of a Patriots and Tom Brady guy, right? And Cam Newton, you know, got to root for the, the new Cam. guy. Certainly a little creepy, but yeah, I'm not a big Aaron Rodgers guy just because everyone, you know, the argument of uh, Rodgers is the GOAT, Brady's the GOAT, Rodgers has one Super Bowl. He's not the GOAT. Don't even talk about him. Yarmir Yager. Oh, the Wolverine. I mean, that's really impressive, but I, I do think that that was from his time as a Bruin. It was. It was very brief, was. and I was fired up to have him, but he literally did not score a goal the entire playoffs, and he was playing with Marshawn and Bergeron. I think he hit the post like three times, but decent <laughs> decent stash. Would have liked a better uh, playoff performance. Bruins could have had another cup, so... Yeah, you're throwing shades at some legends here. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Ruiz, your teammate. Ooh, that's maybe worse than Rogers. Good, 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 Sally. The uh, are you not entertained uh, gladiator? But uh, that's a it's a tough stash. One more here for you. Another teammate of yours, Nicola Levesque. Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, he, he's just you know got the the classic. Uh, you know, French, Frenchy, uh, little pencil thin mustache. I'd like to see him maybe uh, let it go a little more and see if he can get some mustache wax, do the uh, little little twisted on the sides. But uh, yeah, he, he pulls it off well. Well, awesome. Hey, Phil, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us here. Really appreciate it, but I can't wait to see you back out on the ice again. Sounds good. Thanks, Casey. 
The Hat City Hockey Show is presented by the Danbury Hat Tricks. Follow at Danbury Hat Tricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to youtube.com slash Danbury Hat Tricks. My next guest on the Hat City Hockey Show is one of the best broadcasters working in the business today. He's the television voice of the New York Islanders on MSG Networks, as well as the Stanley Cup playoffs in the Premier Lacrosse League on NBC Sports. Please welcome Brendan Burke. Brendan, how's everything going with you? Because I know you said your wife is expecting. Yeah, we're uh, we're on baby watch any any time now. So if I have to leave abruptly, you'll uh, you'll understand. <laughs> Hey, if anything, that would help our view numbers. Hey, watch yeah, Brian wife going to labor live <laughs> on camera. <laughs> yep. We'll get to the aisles in a moment here with the questions, but I first want to point out that I believe you worked in my backyard for a while because I am in Dutchess County, New York, which is home of the Hudson Valley Renegades. And I know that you were a Penn Leaguer for a while for the Batavia Muck Dogs. Uh, I have to ask, as a lover of minor league baseball myself, what is the silliest between innings competition that you had to MC down on the field? I've done many, um, you know, dizzy bat races. And I, I, I remember something like a pizza toss. I'm not quite sure, but I, I, yeah, whatever ridiculous stuff. I did them for, uh, for the 2006 Batavia Muck Dogs home games. I was uh, the on-field MC, dizzy bat race host. And yeah, um, I've tried to block a lot of that out. <laughs> <laughs> I read an article where I think it was your dad said that he was sometimes half your audience. Is, is that accurate? I'm sure there were sometimes he was 100% of my audience. You know, my dad has been uh, my biggest supporter and somebody that um, that literally listens to or watches everything I do. Um, you know, if he misses an Islander game, he will you know, record it and go back and watch it later that night. Um, and he texts me and says, don't spoil the ending. So um, back when I was in college and when I was you know first starting out in the minor leagues, he was um, the, the, the Mets beat writer for the Star Ledger. And uh, he would be watching a Mets game with an earphone and listening to me call a baseball game at the same time, um, just because he, that's that's what he did, so. I tell you, minor league baseball is always really funny. I remember I was, I was covering a Renegades game for local media once, and uh, the on-field competition that uh, was going on was, was people were on their knees trying to eat a dangling marshmallow that was like on some kind of rack over their head. The problem is that the marshmallow was hanging too high for anyone to reach from the ground, so nothing is happening. Uh, everyone is just awkwardly facing up, and the press box is right next to the PA booth, and our PA guy over the last week is going, and it looks like Johnny is in the lead. We are never doing this competition ever again. Oh, but Jane is catching up. Shut them down. Get the F off the field now. <laughs> Yeah, I was also the, the PA announcer for the Peoria Chiefs of the uh, the Midwest League for a few years. And um, there were a few, um, if I remember correctly, the frozen t-shirt contest where you have to unwrap a frozen t-shirt and put it on, um, which is cold and, and awful, but um, it, it's also impossible if they're too frozen. And so you just have people just, just pulling at blocks of ice for you know, 90 seconds, and they're like, oh, well, Lena's gonna start, get off the field, see you later, goodbye. I'm sure no matter how weird or, or low rent or odd uh, minor league baseball felt, I'm sure in terms of unpleasant broadcasting experiences, nothing tops Hockey Day Minnesota in freezing cold temperatures. Is it true that you worked in minus 30 degree weather? And if so, how, how do you still have every appendage? You know, it's one of those experiences, looking back on it was a really cool experience. Uh, going through it was was cool, except for I just couldn't feel my feet for days afterwards. I mean, it was I was not properly equipped. I didn't really understand, one, how cold it was going to be, and two, just I think the feet were the biggest problem. You know, once your feet go, there's no getting warm. It was bad. It was, it was 32 below, I think, at one point. The wind was just howling, and you could see, you know, the, the players were playing in it. So me, I was just standing there, but I had to do three games, which is, you know, about eight hours worth of standing outside. The coaches on the bench had snow on just one half of their face because the snow was just flying straight into their <laughs> face. But also for one of the teams, it was going straight at them as they were trying to get towards the goal. So that wasn't, they, they wound up switching sides halfway through the third period to kind of even out the elements. They couldn't get us warm drinks. Like if they brought us hot chocolate, it was cold by the time it got to us. The water bottle that I was using to try and keep hydrated during the broadcast kept freezing. Um, it was frozen solid by the first intermission of the first game. So it was just, it became a, a really tough task of just trying to do normal things in that temperature. And uh, at the end of the night, the third game was, was the girls game and it was dark. So it got even colder and you're just kind of just, just standing there. 
and the, the game was over. We got in the car and we drove three hours back to the hotel that I was staying at by the airport because I had to leave the next day. And I literally was still in my coat and, and all the layers that I've been wearing all day. And I literally just climbed into bed. And I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. Um, I think <laughs> I took a warm shower after a while and, uh, and I got up the next morning. And, and again, my feet literally did hurt for a couple of days after that. But it was, uh, it was fun. It's one of the more fun events that I've done. I've done it. I did it five times, I think, and that was the only one that was anything close to that um, in terms of temperature wise. I haven't had the pleasure of calling an outdoor game yet in my career. I've been in certain buildings that feel like they're in minus 30 degrees. The rinks out on Hopog on Long Island feels brutally cold where the PAL Junior Islanders play. Uh, my broadcast partner uh, with me in Danbury game, Zach McGinnis, always talks about he did an outdoor game in 2016. Uh, between Danbury was playing a uh, Brewster at an outdoor rink and he called the game I, he always says that it's like zero degrees minus 10 degrees but he called the game from a cherry picker overlooking the ice so not only is it cold and the wind is whipping on you but you are rocking back and forth in this rickety old like four by four opening overlooking the ice we were on a, on a structure that was built which was basically just scaffolding um the, you know, temporary scaffolding. And we had a, a clamshell tent that you would use to, I guess, go ice fishing, theoretically. Um, but in those instances, like I said, the wind was so bad, it kept actually collapsing the tent down. And I actually got hit in the head a few times while the broadcast was going on from the tent, just kind of imploding on me. And they actually had to take, I think they wanted to take like a light stand and just kind of reinforcing it from the inside to keep it from actually collapsing on us while we were trying to do it. I, that's that's just a metaphor for the whole experience, right? Just trying to keep the roof from caving in over your head. I mean, such is life, right? The fun of minor leagues is sometimes the the foibles and the misadventures. Uh, your first gig in hockey, correct me if I'm wrong, was ECHL hockey in Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, one of our goalies last year, Nick Nieder, who is one of the most well-traveled goalies in hockey, uh, is a former nailer. He was on an episode of Spit and Chicklets with Paul Bissonnette, another former nailer. And they both agreed that Wheeling's sleeper bus was a 50-50 shot whether or not it started. They agreed that it was just the worst. Can you confirm this? And what is the worst road trip that you can remember? The bus had its issues. I'm sure um, it still does, but um, it, it did back. I was there the 2006, 7, and 7, 8 seasons um, with Paul Bissonnette. Um, so I, I know what he's speaking of it, the bus itself, like the inside was nice. Uh, you know, in terms of sleeper buses, it, it was best, definitely better to have one than to not have one. I actually worked for the Peoria Riverman for five years in the American hockey league and they had their sleeper bus was actually a converted tractor trailer. So it looked like a truck driving down the highway and it had like, like cruise ship porthole windows in a few of the spots in the back. Otherwise you would think it was just cargo. Happy New Year from Ice Time Online. I'm Brennan Burke with Nick Haddon, the Director of Team Transportation for the Peoria Riverman. He's gonna help give us a little tour of the Riverman team bus. You know, three high bunks all the way back and it's it slept 24, I wanna say. Um, I was not one of those 24 um, because, you know, low man on the totem pole. But um, I once, I, I will say probably the worst one that I was on though, um, I did one season, just because we're talking about minor leagues, I did one season of AF2, Arena Football 2. <laughs> Um, the Peoria Pirates. We were on that sleeper bus, the same one that the Riverman used, which was great, except for just as we were about to leave, and again, this is football season, so this was July, the generator that controlled the air conditioning blew. Oh no. <laughs> so, again, like I said, there's really no windows. Like, there's no openable windows. There's one in the back and one in the front, and that's pretty much it. And and you're in these, these coffins really of, of beds right like you've got you know, a, a, somebody six inches above you and six inches below you like just stacked on top of each other so there's no air circulation without the air conditioning and it went and we went from peoria to albany new york and i don't remember how long that took 18 hours 16 hours something like that i remember some of these linemen these 300 pound linemen getting off the bus looking like they were climbing out of a swimming pool just completely completely <laughs> so and then uh of course you play and then have to turn around and do it all over again to go back um so that's probably the most memorable like horrible bus ride experience i've had buses break down i had one catch fire um we've blown tires like it's well, just, <laughs> you spend 10 years in the minor leagues in doing hockey and baseball and football and it's just it's, bound, it's part of the territory, so. Let's get to the actual pleasant part uh, when you actually make it to the big leagues, uh, the, the prestige of making it to MSG Networks. 
Uh, this was a heck of the year for the New York Islanders, making it all the way to game six of the Eastern Conference final against the eventual champions, the Tampa Bay Lightning. And instead of calling round one in, in brisk April evenings on the island, you're heading to the 11 Penn Studios in the heat of August. What was the 2020 playoff experience like for you? It was bizarre at first. I mean, it's just um, unnatural, really. You know, you're, you're going in at a, a strange time of year, and then you're going into you know, an air conditioned studio where you're trying to stay away from everybody and you're wearing masks and um, you're trying to make it as normal as possible. You know, one of the things that, you know, I've heard people complain about the fake crowd noise. It was a huge help for me personally to try and just forget about everything else and just try and be in the moment of those broadcasts and of those games, right? Because my whole job is to try and make it sound like I'm in the arena and have the same energy that I would. And having that, even the just murmur of, of ambient noise behind you made it feel a little bit more natural. And to the point where, you know, was it ideal? No. Could I see everything? Did I miss things? You know, absolutely I missed stuff. Um, was I caught by surprise on things that I normally wouldn't be caught by surprise? Yeah. Um, but you just kind of do what you can with it. And uh, and we got used to it. And, and fortunately for the Islanders and for myself, they had played long enough where I could get used to it. I was shuttling back and forth uh, between NBC and MSG and doing, you know, two games in a day at some, sometimes, which was fun. Um, and, you know, a very unique situation where under normal circumstances would never happen. So um, kind of cool to look back on and, and hopefully I never have to do it again. <laughs> I remember watching that day when you had two in a row. It was like the Islanders played at like one o'clock and then you were calling like the five o'clock game. And I was I'm like, I, I was just hearing him. How, did, yeah. how is he doing that? I, it's funny you mentioned the crowd noise because uh, especially for anyone who has seen the booth cam videos that you set up last year, you're right in it. And especially at the Barkley Center, you can see the fans celebrating over your shoulder. So you go from being so immersed like that to all of a sudden, you know, Butch is, is your audience. And I'm sure that's, you know, not that performing for Butch isn't great, but uh, it's got to be so wonky going from one atmosphere to the next, especially when you have to call games off of a monitor, right? I mean, that must be like trying to narrate a video game. Like you're talking about playoff games. So you're talking about intensity and every shift could mean the difference in the season. And sometimes when you get into those do or die games, every shift is the difference between whether you're playing again tomorrow or you're not. And so that type of intensity is really hard to manufacture without actually feeling it yourself. You know, Barclay Center is a, is, a, is a basketball building and it was built with basketball in mind and hockey was, was an afterthought. That being said, they didn't build a press box. It does not exist. There is no press box at Barclay Center. So we sit on a camera platform where normally there are cameras, you know, there are cameras, they're behind us, but the cameras that are shooting the action, we're sitting right in front of them. And it's not meant to be a broadcast position, but we make it a broadcast position and it's actually a really good broadcast position and you get to feel the energy of the building. That's not the case in every NHL building. Some places you're so far removed, New Jersey and Edmonton, where you might as well be calling it off a monitor because you, you're nowhere near the crowd and you can't feel it at all. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm spoiled with the fact that at the Coliseum, the smallest building in the league, and at Barclay Center, the closest broadcast vantage point in the league, you know, I have that energy to feed off of. When it doesn't have that same energy, would it sound like I was just screaming into the wind? You know, would I, would I sound over the top if I did what it normally would require? Um, and so that first game, I just kind of felt my way through it and went back and listened to it and watched it to see how it felt, you know, watching it as opposed to, to doing it. Um, and I just kind of tried to find that balance of, of what made sense. But I think people, and even myself before I'd done it, when you say call games off monitor, you think I'm sitting in this truck with a wall full of every angle that I can see and I can just look at whatever I want. And that's not the case. The case is I have a television in front of me that looks exactly like yours in front of you, except yours is probably better and bigger. Um, <laughs> and I'm trying to work off of that. And so if I can't see it on the screen, I do not know it's there. And so it seemed like every penalty that was called in the entire playoff was called by the back referee with his arm up off the screen. And you're like, that looked like a trip. I have no idea if they're gonna call it or not. We'll just wait and see if the whistle blows. There's a play, Matt Barzell scores uh, an overtime game winner. He never showed up on the screen until he was on a breakaway. Yeah, yeah. It looked as if Jordan Everly is dumping the puck in because he's one on two at the red line. And all of a sudden he slides it past the defenseman and Matt Barzell turns and cuts in. I'm like, oh, he's on a breakaway. Didn't know he was on the ice. So there's really nothing I can do about it except react and try not to sound stupid. But 
I give you a lot of credit for that because not only is it incredibly difficult, uh, you guys uh, for the entire playoff crew made it seem so seamless. You know, identifying players on that kind of camera angle from the side can sometimes be very difficult unless they have a very distinct hairstyle. You know, you're able to tell Mika Zibanejad because his hair is flopping behind him. If, if you're to the untrained eye, you know, Brock Nelson, Anders Lee may look kind of similar because they're, they're both, you know, white guys skating down in blue jerseys. You know, you may not be able to tell. Their numbers both start with two. You know, you may be able to get them mixed up. Uh, so I give you, I give you Doc, I give John Forsland, you know, the guys that stuck through the playoffs a ton of credit because that was a very difficult job. Yeah, don't, uh, give, don't give Forslund any credit. He was one of the only lucky guys that actually got to go. He, so he was <laughs> – all his mistakes all right, were enough. legit. No, John, Johnny's great. But, but in reality, if you watched a game in the United States of America um, during that playoff and it wasn't called by John Forslund, Kenny Albert, or in the first round, Gord Miller – that broadcaster was working off a monitor. Those are the only guys that got to go into the bubble. Which is incredible. One of the words that you used there that I picked up on was energy. You know, trying to capture that same energy without fans. And that's especially prevalent in an Islanders broadcast because Islander fans are so raucous. I think back to the, the season that's most fascinating to me for, in your career is the 2018-19 campaign for the Islanders because you have the Barry Trotz era beginning, the return to the Coliseum, John Tavares' game, the sweep of the Penguins in, in your first Stanley Cup action. Uh, what were your emotions like during that season? And how do you take that palpable fan energy and channel it into a creative, impactful broadcast. It, it was a special season, and it became more special as it as it progressed. You're talking about a team that um, was left for dead, and no one gave a chance. I, I, and I, there were a lot of articles, and I'm not picking on the media. But like I said, my dad's a sports writer. Um, on paper, the Islanders didn't look very good, and I get that. But there were articles, literally, I think Deadspin had an article that said, ranking the 2018-19 NHL teams from the best to the Islanders. Those I remember that. Important. I remember that. That's locker room board material. Right, but you're talking about a team that eventually won a round in the playoffs and was a legitimate threat, you know, as the season progressed and, and and didn't win the division, but had home ice advantage in the first round of the playoffs. I mean, that's that's ridiculously wrong. So it was more about unraveling, you know, what are we watching? Um, you know, this team that no one gave a chance. It was... It was not that they didn't give them a chance at the beginning of the season. They didn't give them a chance every single night during that season. If you read the paper the day after the Islanders beat a team, it was, boy, the Penguins had a bad night. Boy, the Flyers had a bad night. Boy, the San Jose Sharks had a bad You know what? Maybe the other team is the reason they had a bad night. It was always the other team's fault. It was always self-inflicted. Disrespect, um, yeah. It's just Barry Trotz's system makes teams look bad or look worse than they are because it is executed properly by the group that they have. And so you had this group um, that did that every night, that had something to prove every single night. And even when they got down to, you know, towards the playoffs, it was like, they're, they're not going to make a run. You know, they have home ice advantage, but they're the underdog against Pittsburgh. Um, so it just, it had that feel the whole season long, which was, a, which was cool to, you know, it was a, it was a prove people wrong mentality all season. You know, and then you've got the Coliseum, which at the beginning of the season was not something anyone was considering. And now you've got that extra energy that they had been lacking at Barclays Center for the previous, you know, two plus seasons. And you've got John Tavares having left and now on a struggling, I shouldn't say struggling Maple Leafs team, but a Maple Leafs team that couldn't get ahead of the Islanders in the standings the whole season. And it was going, well, did you make the right call? It was just, you know, trying to capture all of that. Um, for our fans was was challenging because there's so many emotions to it, but it was also something that made a regular season more than a regular season. There was no, you know, sometimes you get through a season and it's it's a Wednesday night and a non-conference opponent and, and, you know, a building's half empty and no one really cares and you're trying to manufacture some of this emotion. Right. And there was nothing to fake there. There was no manufacturing. The building was full every night. Um, so it was a, it was a fun season to, to make a run through and, um, you know, it's been, it's been even better that they've kind of continued that, um, you know, with the last season where again, people are like, yeah, well, let's see if they can do it again. And it's like, okay, they did it again. Now, now what do they need to do to prove to you that they're actually a decent hockey team? So <laughs> what would Islander fans not know about Butch Goring that you've learned from years of working with him? 
I don't know. I mean, the, the, the best thing about Butch on the broadcast is that Butch on the broadcast is the exact same thing as Butch off the broadcast. Like he's not, it's not an act. Um, he's not faking anything and he is just as fun to hang out with off the air than he is to do the games on the air. And I think that's why we have such a good rapport on the air is because neither of us are faking it. We actually enjoy each other's company. We actually enjoy spending time together. We spend a lot of time together um, you know, with, with, um, ever since, since Lou came aboard, you know, we travel away for, uh, separately from the team. And so we go to the rink together in the morning. We come back to the hotel after morning skate. We go to the rink together in the afternoon. We do the game together. We come back to the hotel. Like we spend a lot of time together and, uh, and it's not a problem. Like we enjoy it. So, um, I think that the butch is an open book and, uh, and I think we all benefit from it, but you know, he is, um, he is everything that you guys see on the air. That's, that's just him. He's, he's not hiding anything. You can cast uh, Mary and Paula aside. He becomes your work husband at that point, right? You get oh, I definitely spend more time with him than I do with my family during, during a hockey season. So um, we're trying to make <laughs> up for that here during this pandemic and trying to even things out a little bit, but he, I think he still might have the edge. <laughs> Uh, finally, I, I have one more question to ask here for you, and it pertains to Doc Emmerich, you know, the legendary broadcaster who just retired. Uh, one of my jobs at MSG Networks when I was a PA there was to edit and tag commercial spots. And one of them during the 2016-17 season when I was there, uh, prominently, I heard it a thousand times over and over, what a goal for Josh Bailey! You'll never see a better goal than that. What a goal for Josh Bailey! You will not see a better goal. And I see on Twitter that you posted a couple of days ago that that led to a, a wonderful interaction with Doc Emmerich. Uh, what were your experiences like with the legendary Emmerich? Boy, yeah. I mean, he is, uh, as a guy who grew up in New Jersey, um, you know, I was, uh, I was watching Doc do hockey what feels like my whole life. You know, he was always the, the gold standard for me, the guy that you wanted to emulate. He made you feel like you were in the building when you were at home. And for me, that's the primary job of a television play-by-play -play guy. It's to bring what you were missing by not being at the arena into your house. You want your broadcaster to make you sit on the edge of your chair and your heart to skip a beat when appropriate. Having gotten to know him a little bit over the past five years, um, he, he's an incredible human being. And I think that's, you know, that's the number one thing about Doc is kind of like Butch. He is, he is genuine. Everything you hear and see on the air is exactly who Doc is. I've had interactions with him where all I want to do is ask him questions. And all he wants to do is ask me questions about me. He wants to know about me and he remembers everybody. Um, and he's just a really, really great person. The story you're alluding to, um, I've got a couple of them, but you know, when I was hired um, back in 2016, you know, I kind of got, I got hired in, in I, the, my, the announcement came in mid August. So it was, it was relatively close to the start of the season. And, you know, my phone blew up, you know, everybody that I've ever met in my whole life, I think, you know, reached out and it was a really fun couple of days to just get text messages and emails and phone calls from everybody that I had met along the way. Um, and then a f it, it kind of died down. And then a few days after that, I got an email from Doc, just out of the blue. And again, I, he had to find somebody and he knows everybody, but he had to find somebody that had my email address, get it and unsolicited, send me an email that just said, Hey, you know, welcome to the club. Uh, hope to see you around the rink one day. And it was just a really cool, you know, like he didn't have to do that. Uh, and I'm not saying anything against anybody else, any of my colleagues. He, he might've been one of the only current NHL broadcasters that reached out to me to congratulate the, the number one guy, right? Like it, it was, it was the guy. My first big moment was a Josh Bailey overtime winner in my third game with the Islanders. And I was feeling pretty good about it. And then I was walking home and I was living in Brooklyn at the time. So I was just walking home and my phone buzzed and he had sent me an email that just said, sounded great tonight. See you soon type of email. And it was, it was the best part of that whole night. And so my first big call and doc to me will always be, you know, married together. And that's a, that's a cool moment for me. And, you know, he's been extremely gracious and, and with his time and, and, you know, his advice to me. Um, and at the same time, like he's the consummate professional. Um, as, as recently as the Islanders series against the Philadelphia Flyers, he was reaching out to me to double check pronunciations on Islanders names. Wow. He, the, he literally writes the pronunciation guide for the National Hockey League. <laughs> he, he writes it. Wow. But 
he's always making sure that he has everything right. And that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's another side of doc that you, you try and live up to. The devil's in the details, right? You always try to get the, the specifics right. And if there's one guy who is strikes you as the details, I mean, it's doc. It feels weird that the NHL says goodbye to him when he's calling games off the monitor, right? Cause he was not on that list of guys that you said were in the bubble. So, as opposed to uh, it was Bob Cole a couple of years ago, right? Who gets to, to wave at the crowd as he's retiring and doc doesn't get that. But in a sense, it almost feels like you don't want to make assumptions for the guy. Doc would never ask for that. Right. He doesn't seem like that kind of guy who would ask for the big emotional farewell. So doc wasn't in, in the bubbles and he wasn't in Stanford, Connecticut at NBC. He stayed home and they set him up with a studio out of his basement in Michigan to call a game. So, Doc Emmerich literally ended his career calling a Stanley Cup final from his house. And I think that's pretty much puts the, the period at the end of this. He did everything, literally everything. Um, something that probably nobody else will ever do is call a Stanley Cup final game from their own house. Um, so uh, while it's, it's, it's not the ideal ending where Doc could have gotten you know, the big send off after his Stanley Cup game, um, and of course he announced it afterwards where he wouldn't want to be the focal point of a moment like that. Um, but at the same time, like, how cool is that to be able to go out on your own terms and be like, you know what, I'm, I'm doing it. This is how I'm doing it. I've officially done it all and there's nothing left for me. Brendan Burke, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate you. Hope you keep safe and healthy through all this. And we hope to hear you back on the air real soon. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. That'll do it for us here on the Hat City Hockey Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell for future episodes. And be sure to join us next week when former NHL goaltender and MSG Networks analyst Steve Valaket is on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Casey Bryant. Take care.